is Joanna Lastor Montes, and I am the graduate assistant for civic literacy and, and on-campus events at Hofstra Center for Civic Engagement. Um, a little bit of the day of dialogue. Um, it's become almost a tradition for the civic, um, for CCE now. Um, our first one was 20 years ago, believe it or not. Um, and it still remains a crucial component to CCE's programming to this day, as you can tell. Um, so we really devote this day to strengthen our, com our, um, our community by diving deeper about issues that affect us all, whether we realize it or not. And so um, a little bit more about our goal for today is to really foster engagement through talk and listening and exchange ideas and opinions about local, national, and international issues. Um, so I am delighted to introduce today's event um, called Demo Demo Democratic Backsliding, How Can We Strengthen the Guardrails of Democracy? Not only because of how crucial it is, but because who's part of today's discussion. So without sharing too much of today's event, I'm very excited to pass the mic to our moderator and introduce our very own Hofstra student, CCE fellow, and Dinincenzo Peace Fellow Award winner for the 2020-2021 year, Alex Atelli. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alex Atilli. Um, I'll be your moderator this afternoon. A bit on me is that I am a political science student with minors in both Spanish and Latin American Caribbean studies. Um, I have been with the Center for Civic Engagement since the second semester of my freshman year, and it has been a wonderful opportunity for me. If you're interested in joining CCE, it's a great, it's a great opportunity. It broadens your horizon so much. You can visit hofstra.edu slash CCE. You can see our podcast, our blog, and all sorts of updates. I'm proud to introduce our three panelists today. So first, speaking first will be Dr. Green, who is a professor of political science here at Hofstra University. He teaches in subfields of comparative politics, international relations, and American politics, including courses related to European politics, foreign policy, and international organization. In addition to these areas, his research interests focus particularly on European integration, political identity, and comparative mass behavior. The other two panelists today are Dr. Parati and Dr. Dudek. Dr. Dudek is a professor of political science here at Hofstra and is the chair of the political science department. She specializes in comparative politics with regional focuses in both Europe and Latin America. She's also engaged in teaching an array of courses such as comparative politics, European politics, and politics of the Euro European Union, plus many, many more. And Dr. Prati is a professor of political science at Hofstra. She has taught courses including American politics, political parties and the voter, and public opinion and political communication and immigration, most of which are classes I've taken with her. <laughs> um, her teaching interests include immigration, public opinion, and the Constitution. So I am pleased to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Green. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you to CCE for putting on this event. Um, I remember actually planning the first of these 20 years ago um, and participating in many others. So I think it's a wonderful tradition that Hofstra has. I'm glad you guys could participate in that. I want to thank my colleagues also for being on the panel. and. Dr. Parati for inviting me to um, participate. So we sort of divided up the domain of our talk today, and I think my angle on it is going to be more related to uh, theoretical and conceptual notes on the question of democratic backsliding. Uh, but I want to start with a little bit of historical context, and I want to turn to the political scientist Samuel Huntington, who published a book on the history and the theory of democratization. And Huntington entitled his book The Third Wave. And he did that because he did a rigorous analysis of every country in the world every year of that country, and he coded them, he rated them according to the degree of democracy he found in all of those places. And what he found when he looked over about two centuries worth of data was that democracy has spread throughout the world in waves. And in fact, he identified three of these. And if you want, I can circle back at some point and give you some dates and, and counts of countries. But just to give you an overview of uh, his findings, there was a large, long wave from basically the beginning of the 19th century to the beginning of the 20th century. And then this is followed by a reverse wave in which a bunch of those countries that have become democracies uh, 
cease being democracies. Then there's a second expansionary wave, another reverse wave, and then a third expansionary wave, hence the title of this book. So Huntington's not with us anymore, but I have little doubt that if he was alive today, I think he would agree that we are now in a third reverse wave of democratization. Why do I say that? Well, what is the state and the count of democracies today? Well, it kind of depends actually on how you count democracies, and that kind of depends on how you define terms. So we'll come back to that question. We'll look at sort of a snapshot of democracy in 2021, but I want to digress for a little bit if we can and think about some definitional questions. And then we'll uh, come back and look at the status of democracy, not only in the world, I know my colleagues are going to talk more about this, and not only um, in the United States, but I want to say a few um, comments about uh, where we are in both of those instances. So let's think for a second about defining democracy. Um, it's not necessarily as simple as you might think it would be to define what is a democracy and what is not. And in fact, I think there are various kind of um, types or categories of democracy. I think we can start with a, a very basic, a very stripped down, a very simple form of democracy that requires basically only this, free and fair elections. I mean, we could throw in a couple other things. It's probably makes sense that you uh, also note that the people who win those elections are actually the ones who wield power, for example. We don't want to have shell Potemkin elections, but nevertheless, we can boil this down to something very simplified, um, a kind of minimalist model that is basically just free and fair elections. And while I think that's not a bad description of democracy um, and a defensible one, at the same time, I think there are certain critiques that we might make of that, certain elements um, in our conception of what a real and, and robust democracy is that don't uh, necessarily fit if you use that minimalist uh, description of democracy. So let me detail a couple of those critiques and you can see what I'm talking about. Imagine, for example, if we had a situation where there was um, free and fair elections, but there was an absence of a free press or the absence of freedom of speech or the absence of genuine uh, opposition parties. Again, it meets, that situation would meet our minimalist definition of democracy, but I, I think it sort of violates the spirit of the concept that most of us have when we think about the term democracy. I don't think it's getting quite there. And the distinction that we're really making there is be, between what you might call a minimalist democracy that we described already and a liberal democracy. And when I use that term, I use, sometimes refer to it as capital L liberalism, meaning the philosophical idea of uh, freedom, uh, not sort of ideological liberalism like Bernie Sanders, let's say. Okay, So we can draw a distinction on the one hand between this minimalist vision of democracy um, that might not include those things, right? And how, how, how much does that really feel like democracy to us if there's no free press and if there's no um, freedom of speech and so on, there's no uh, opposition parties. A second scenario that kind of draws um, into question this minimalist definition. Imagine you do have free and fair elections, but you, and maybe you do it once, maybe you do it twice, maybe you do it three times, but there's no turnover of the keys to the government from party A to party B. Does that s smell like democracy to us? Maybe, but it's, it's sort of, I think, problematic. And here the distinction that we're making is between the minimalist democracy, again, on the one hand, and what we might call a consolidated democracy, on the other hand, one in which actually Party A has given over power voluntarily and peaceably to Party B. And, and the country has sort of made that transition to a consolidated democracy. Third, um, you might also sort of say, well, is it a democracy if you have high levels of corruption, if you have high levels of government incompetence, if there's a lack of judicial independence? This is another kind of series of critiques one could make against that kind of minimalist definition of democracy. And then finally, I think another critique one might make is, what if you did have that minimalist vision of democracy, but very low levels of participation? What if, for example, people didn't vote, um, or at least not very much? Would that really sort of fit our sense of what democracy is? And I think, for me at least, the answer to all those questions is no. That minimalist definition of democracy is useful, particularly as a political scientist, it may be useful. And in fact, that's exactly what Huntington used when he was counting waves of democratization. Um, but it doesn't really kind of fit with what I feel in my gut is what democracy ought to be, right? And you can sort of see all the various critiques going on there. And in fact, we have another term for this, these um, variations, or really sort of the minimalist democracy uh, absent these other um, characteristics I mentioned, many people would describe this as a hollow democracy. So yes, it fits the minimalist definition, 
but it lacks a lot of other things. And if you look around the world today, I think there's a, you know, there are a lot of good examples, unfortunately, of hollow democracies, but maybe Vladimir Putin's Russia is the best current exemplar of them. So if we have these conceptual ideas understood, then we can ask the question, what's the status of democracy in our world today? It depends a lot on what definition you use. I've just given you sort of five or six different definitions there. It depends on what data you employ. It depends on what model uh, for analyzing that data and how you classify um, the various categories that you come up with. And there's a lot of um, folks out there who are doing good work and kind of trying to answer this question. Where is democracy in the world? How much democracy is there in the world? What are the uh, chronological trend lines? So um, I wanna share with you just one of those uh, efforts and that's called the Democracy Index and it's produced by a prominent journal of politics you may be familiar with called The Economist. The Economist in its Democracy Index um, uses a variety of factors. It's a, a fairly robust definition, very much not a minimalist definition like we were just talking about. And what it does is it scores countries every time, it, every iteration that it does this, which is either every two years, sometimes every year, it scores countries on a whole host of variables and then it rolls up those numbers into some composite scores and then it can rank that country in terms of its total level of democracy and then it can rank that against other countries in the world. And then it can take those, that list of whatever 170 countries I think they use and divide that into kind of categories. And in fact, they come up with four categories. So one at the top would be what they call full democracies. This is a country that would have not only free and fair elections, but an independent judiciary, a well-functioning government, a free media, and like that. The next category below full democracy is what they, they call flawed democracies. These are countries that have free elections and basic civil liberties, but the media might be impaired, and there might be low levels of participation in politics, for example. Then there's a third category, and really I think from the second to the third, you're sort of transitioning out of democracy land into non-democracy land. But nevertheless, we can specify these four categories as they do. The third one is called hybrid regimes. And in these countries, free and fair elections don't really even exist, uh, and political opponents of the government as well as the media and the judiciary are, are frequently harassed um, and pressured. And then finally, you have full-blown authoritarian regimes. These could be absolute monarchies or dictatorships. Here, you're gonna find basically no free media, no elections, no independent judiciary, very few civil liberties. So in 2020, the Economist study classified about 170 countries in the world, and here's the count they came up with. 23 countries were rated as full democracies, 52 countries were rated as flawed democracies, 35 countries were rated as hybrid regimes and 57 countries as authoritarian regimes, okay? So if you take those four categories and, and group the top two and the bottom two, you get roughly half and half, a little bit more in the bottom tier, less democracy than in the top tier, but roughly half and half of the 170 countries there. By the way, the United States um, ranks at 25th highest on this list and it's falling. And in fact, in 2016, the United States was downgraded from a full democracy to a flawed democracy. And since 2016, the score for the United States has been falling incrementally uh, ever since then. So how did we get here? Um, how do we get to this third reverse wave? Uh, in order to understand that situation, I would draw a lot of um, content and ideas from this book by Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt. You can see it's entitled How Democracies Die. It's a good book and I use it in my comparative politics class. And the authors um, do a lot of things in this book. One thing they do is to describe a distinction between how democracies typically used to die versus how they now more typically die. So the case of Chile in 1960, sorry, 1973 is a good example of the old model. You had a president of Chile, he wakes up one morning, he's president of the country. By the evening, he's not president of the country anymore. And a, a, and a general is running the country and continues to do so in a dictatorship for the next couple of decades. What happened in between morning and evening? Well, a bunch of people stormed the presidential palace and loaded him, his body up with bullets and he was dead. And it was a coup, it happened like that. You go from democracy to non-democracy. That's kind of the old model. The new model that they describe is, has two really important distinguishing elements. First of all, rather than happening suddenly, it happens incrementally. So over a long period of time, chip by chip, bit by bit, 
elements of democracy and civil liberties and all the things that we were just talking about in defining democracy are removed one by one by one. And here's the other thing that's really interesting about their new model, uh, the more current model for, by which democracies die, and that is the agents who do it are not coming from outside the government. They are the government. They are often duly elected presidents and prime ministers who come into office and begin to dismantle the democratic system which they have inherited through an election process. If you're looking for a good example of that, and again, unfortunately, there's all too many of them in the world, but you might look at uh, President Erdogan of Turkey. He's been in office for about two decades now. He was elected and has been elected repeatedly through a democratic process. But over those two decades, freedom of the press, freedom of non-governmental organizations, freedom of academics, freedom of the people to protest, all of these things have been severely curtailed. And similarly, at the same time, the power of the military, the power of the judiciary, and the power of alternative political parties have also been dramatically diminished. So if you look at Turkey today versus Turkey 20 years ago, you might see a situation that's not very different from what you saw in Chile, except the difference is it took 20 years to do that, whereas in Chile it happened overnight. Um, and the other thing is, who are the agents who actually did it? It was the duly elected president, sometimes prime minister, of Turkey, not somebody coming from outside the government to do it. So these are two key differences. Turkey's a good example. Uh, Poland would be a good example. Hungary would be a good example. Brazil, the Philippines, India, all of these are countries which are following the second model of um, reducing democracy in our time. Regrettably, I think it would be dangerously myopic to believe that the United States isn't also on this unfortunate list in 2021. And I'll come back to that point a little bit later. Um, so Levitsky and Zablat also do another thing in the book. They give us a framework or a set of identifying characteristics to help us identify people who are would-be autocrats, those who are opposed to democracy and will, in fact, given the capacity and the power, diminish and destroy democracy. And they come up with four such indicators. And I can go into more detail on these, but in the interest of time, I'll just label them for you. The first indicator is a lack of commitment to or rejection of the rules of the game of democracy. The second indicator is the denial of the legitimacy of political opponents. The third indicator is a toleration or even encouragement of political violence. And the fourth indicator is a readiness to curtail the civil liberties, the freedoms of political opponents and the media. So um, I think this book, as I mentioned, is a great book. It's very astute in a lot of ways. Um, there is one place where I do disagree with the authors, however, and fairly adamantly. And that is their remedy for this condition that we're experiencing in the world in a lot of places, a lot of countries going from being democratic to non-democratic. And what they basically argue is the problem is we don't have adequate gatekeepers, and those gatekeepers need to be party leaders. Their thesis is basically there's always going to be these autocratic types running around the world, right? Donald Trump, for example, or Erdogan, for example, or whomever you want to add onto the list. The way to block them is to have party leaders in a democracy prevent them from ascending to power. That's their model. That's their solution to the problem. I disagree with that for two reasons. One is, in order to do that, you essentially have to kill democracy in order to save democracy. You basically have to say to voters in primary elections, uh, sorry, you picked this person here to be the nominee of your party, who just, you know, parentheses, happens to have autocratic tendencies. We, handful of people in smoke-filled rooms, we party bosses are gonna say to you, no, you can't do that. That's a profoundly non-democratic thing to do. So my concern is, um, how much democracy do you have left if you're doing that in, in order to save democracy? The other thing that's problematic to my mind is that um, when you do that, you expect party leaders to rise to the occasion. Party leaders have lots of incentives to do exactly the opposite of that. And frankly, if you look today, I'll give America as an example, at virtually every office holder in the Republican Party at the national level in the United States today, I think what you see is not only people who refuse to do that, but in fact are going further than that, they are purging the party of anybody who's willing to do that, who's willing to um, demand democracy, who's willing to tell the truth about what's going on in the United States today. So uh, to my mind, uh, depending on party leaders is A, um, to, in order to save democracy, not very democratic if, the, if you're having them uh, say, you can't have this candidate, you have to have our candidate. And B, also probably not very pragmatic at the end of the day, and I think we're witnessing that in the, in the United States. 
So to my mind, um, the ultimate, ultimate solution, the only real solution for the preservation of democracy would be the wholesale teaching of civics to everybody in the society, the widespread adoption of democratic values by the broader public, and an unwavering insistence by the public that those values be respected, protected, and upheld. And I think if you don't do those things, if you don't reside that protection in the body politic, um, I don't think there's much reason to expect democracies to thrive or to last very long. Which brings me to America in 2021. Um, this is the threat that America faces today. We have, by my estimate, something like 35%, maybe 40% of the population that's not interested in democracy anymore. It's interested in winning, and if democracy has to be destroyed and thrown under the bus in order to win, that's fine. You have an entire ideology today, and I mean almost literally an entire ideology, conservatism in America, and almost an entire political party. And if you doubt me, I can give you some examples of people who have been thrown out of the Republican Party or thrown out of positions of power because they refuse to sort of imbibe this particular um, ethos about what is, what is proper and what is uh, moral and what is uh, normative. Um, so you have virtually the entire Republican Party today that no longer subscribes to these norms anymore. They don't put the preservation of the system of democracy in front of victory, in front of power, or even in front of career. And if they have to choose between winning and preserving the democratic system, they choose winning. So you see this over and over again. You see this in radical gerrymandering. You see this in voter suppression, which is going on all over the country in Republican-controlled states. You see this in the concept of loading up the courts in order to have policy made in non-democratic institutions rather than have Congress do it. You see this in false claims about election fraud. You see this in election workers and even school board members who are being intimidated and, and threatened and assaulted. You see this in the staging of an attempted coup against the United States government as occurred on January 6th of this year. And you see this then in the whitewashing of the events or the attempt to whitewash those events of that day. And you see this in the use of racism, sexism, homophobia, and xenophobia to, an to animate angry voters and to get them to vote Republican. This book was published in 2018, probably written in 2017. And even then, the authors using those four indicators that I mentioned looked at Donald Trump, looked at the Republican Party, and said, this is an, an autocrat. This is a would-be autocratic um, movement, and it threatens American democracy. But think about everything that's transpired since then, and particularly uh, what transpired on January 6th of this year. So since 2017, a lot, of, lot more of that water has gone under the bridge. And in particular, I think we can identify three things that we know about the 2020 election that are really critical in terms of um, the, the idea of American uh, democracy being preserved. First, we know that Donald Trump, the sitting president of the United States, encouraged an armed mob to storm the US Capitol and violently prevent Congress from certifying an election he had lost. Never in American history has that happened. Second, we know that Trump was strong arming officials in various states as well as in the Federal Justice Department, which is America's chief law enforcement agency. Trump is strong arming them, pressuring them to throw the election to him to make false allegations of fraud. And third, we know that he was following a blueprint. All these things are happening at the same time. He's following a blueprint for how to undermine via legal chicanery the regular practice of certifying the election and thus deny voters in a democracy their choice for president. In sum, this is a dark and dangerous moment for American democracy. I think it's a dark and dangerous moment for the concept of democracy worldwide, but particularly in sort of the flagship country for democracy in the world. And the only long-term solution that I see is to create a public that overwhelmingly subscribes to and upholds the norms and practices of democracy, even when, maybe especially when, their side loses an election. We are very, very close, I think, scarily close to losing American democracy near the end of a 250-year successful experiment in creating democracy in the world. There was a thin line in 2020 that saved us from that fate. It almost happened just, just this year. We had Capitol Police who were willing to put their lives on the line, and some of them lost their lives to protect American democracy. We had election officials, including some Republican election officials in Republican states who were willing to say the truth and who were willing to sustain death threats and who were willing to throw their career 
to the ground in order to tell the truth about what happened there, even though Donald Trump was calling them up and saying, can't you just find me 11,000 votes? Can't you just find me 11,000 votes? Right? And they were willing to say no. And we, had a, and we had judges as well who were willing to say no to 60 different lawsuits that were, were brought to try to overturn the results of the election. Those things are steadily being replaced now by more willing actors who in 2024 may not make the same decisions, probably won't if we're not careful and we can lose American democracy. So I urge you to pay attention to these issues. If you care about democracy, I certainly do. I think it's something we need to preserve for ourselves and for the world. I'm sorry if I went a little too long, but thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to thank as well Alex for bringing us all together and for Professor Parati for also inviting us to participate. Um, and thank you, Professor Green, for setting up such a nice, robust way of talking about democracy that will lead us into talking about Europe and then back to um, the United States again. And I also want to thank um, the Center for Civic Engagement for engaging us in a complex and challenging discussion. So. The, the overall talk was a discussion about democratic backsliding and the guardrails of democracy. And Professor Prati had asked me to talk a little bit about what is going on in Europe when we think about democratic backsliding and uh, many of the things that Professor Green is talking about that we're seeing here in the United States and in other parts of the world. So what I want to set up for you is a little bit of a backdrop of explaining sort of how is it that this backsliding is happening? How are certain political parties able to come to power, grab hold to power? And as Professor Green talks about in uh, How Democracies Die, um, little by little whittle away the democratic character of countries. And the two countries I'm gonna focus on and they're not the only ones we can talk about in Europe, but the two that I'm gonna focus on are Poland and Hungary. And then I'll try to sort of end up in looking at, you know, are there guardrails? Um, and I'm gonna kind of probably leave that a little bit as a question mark. So some things to think about in looking at Europe today and what is going on, particularly with political parties, the issues that, that are shaping the political dynamics in Europe, um, is the Euro crisis, which you know we can date it back to 2008. And there really was a sense and a, and, a, and a level of discontent among citizens as to how government failed them. That, uh, you know, depending on what, which country we're talking about, um, in some countries, people were losing their homes, like what was happening here in the United States. In some countries, you had high levels of unemployment. In other countries, um, the government itself was decreasing welfare programs for people that were unemployed and they found themselves homeless and jobless. And so you have a, a level of discontent and a lot of social economic turmoil in Europe. And out of that comes a great deal of what we call Euroscepticism, this feeling that the European Union is problematic and that the euro crisis around the common currency of the euro was the European Union's fault. And the European Union was also stepping into many of these countries and stating you have to follow certain economic policies. And some of those economic policies were governments stop spending, and that meant not as many welfare programs, not as many programs to help people that were unemployed. And so we have the growth of Euroscepticism also happening in Europe around the Euro crisis. The other issue that emerges in Europe is the migrant crisis. And starting in the summer of 2015, you have a, a mass exodus, particularly from the Middle East, namely Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and then also throughout Africa, and particularly North Africa, arriving on the shores of Europe. 
And when I say arriving on the shores of Europe, by the tens of thousands, we're talking about millions of people showing up, um, and particularly in like small islands that just didn't have the infrastructure uh, to deal with this migration crisis. So if you think about the socioeconomic turmoil of Europe, and then add in a migrant crisis, and the perspective of citizens of now we got to take care of these foreigners, right? These people that are coming in. Um, what is government doing? And we could also probably throw in terrorism in there too, which kind of adds to the, the sense of citizens saying we have terrorist attacks going on on our soil. We have immigrants coming in, even though those terrorist attacks happened by Europeans. Um, the sense of where's government and who's taking care of us. So a lot of insecurity going on in Europe. And what that contributes to is an increasing rise of the far right. Now we can trace sort of the contemporary, if you will, rise of the far right. We can trace it back to like the 1970s, um, and particularly linked to an anti-immigration movement um, as we have economic decline in Europe. So we're seeing you know, another wave of the rise of the far right, and I'll sort of come back to this when we talk about Poland and Hungary. And so the result of some of this backdrop, and I'm kind of giving a quick overview for the, the time that we have, but what we're seeing in Europe is a rise of what we call illiberalism. And Professor Green gave you a nice definition of liberalism with a capital L. And I'm gonna talk about illiberalism um, and illiberal democracy, which is an oxymoron. But we'll, I'll come back to that. I'm gonna talk about those, these two definitions. And populism is the other piece. So we have the emergence of illiberal and populist governments. And what we're seeing, and this is exactly what Professor Green was talking about, is the violation of the rule of law um, and really putting the European Union, which is premised upon a club of democracies, in jeopardy. And so I want to kind of come back, if I may, to both illiberalism and populism and try to kind of define them for you so you have a better sense of what I'm talking about. So let's start with illiberalism. So we had Professor Green's definition of liberalism. And you know, the way we think about liberalism is you think about things like independent courts. We think about regulatory bodies that are not controlled by corporations. They act independently. You have ensured constitutional rights, civil liberties. You have freedom of the press. And the other important piece is that it's not just majority rule. You have protection for minorities as well. And, and that's kind of the broad definition of what one would expect of a liberal democracy or liberalism, capital L. Now, what's illiberalism? So illiberalism is that we don't have an independent judiciary. There's lack of freedom of press and lack of academic freedom in universities. And I'll come back to this as well. Um, these are like those little cuts that Professor Green is talking about that maybe it takes 20 years to get to, but these are the kinds of things that get whittled away from the inside that we talk about the idea of illiberal democracies. And again, it's a, it's a strange term. How can we put illiberalism and democracy together? Um, what an illiberal democracy refers to is that you have democratically elected leaders. So that bare bone definition of democracy, fair and free elections that Professor Green was talking about, they have them in these countries. But what happens is when the leadership comes into power, they use their democratic little d powers to actually undermine democracy. And that's what we're seeing in Poland and in Hungary, and I'll come to those two cases a little bit, a little bit later. Now, how is it that these political parties, because it really is focused on particular political parties that are doing this, how is it that they're able to come into the system and change it so much? And that has to do with populism. 
And we've heard this a lot, like populist leaders. And I want to kind of give you a definition. Um, I'm using Cas uh, Muda's definition, which is kind of the standard bearer, at least in European politics, for what is populism. And it's this belief that if we think about society, it's divided into the pure people, the good people, and the corrupt elites. And it argues that there's this idea of like the general will of the people. And so party leaders will say, well, I'm representing the general will of you good people against those bad, evil elites. And the strange thing is that the people and the elites are seen as sharing the same interests and the values. Like we want a great America, but the good people, right? The pure are not corrupt. And so this, there's this sort of boogeyman in the room that there are evil people and there are good people. And the populists are representing, the, you know, the claim is they're representing the will of the good people, not the evil people. And the other piece is that these populist leaders claim that they alone represent the whole people. They will save you. They will save the good people. Sound familiar? <laughs> and then the last piece is that you see a lot of this populism coupled with um, nativism or nativist feelings, this idea that, well, you have to be from here. You know, the immigrants, the foreigners are the other, and we have to be careful of them. And also anti-global ideas. So ideas of globalization, international trade. In the context of, of Europe, the European Union itself, this idea of Euroscepticism gets played into. They're seen as the evil elite. So I'd like to take these ideas and kind of jump into a couple case studies. We could probably say um, we see these same things in some other European countries, but I'm going to just focus on these two. I'd like to first talk about Hungary. And the one thing that I want to mention about you know, both of these countries, Hungary and Poland, keep in mind that both of these uh, went through democratic transitions in the early 90s. Um, they were considered very successful transitions. They were considered consolidated democracies. And we talk about transition language that Professor Green was using. Um, we thought that these countries were going in the right direction. In uh, the case of Hungary, the party that is control, in control, and it is a far right populist style party, is the Fidesz party. And it's under the control of Viktor Orban, who is the prime minister. Viktor Orban came to power in 1998 to 2002, and then he returned again as prime minister in 2010, and he's been there ever since. Um, the, the basic ideas of Fidesz is a strong anti-immigration policy. Um, it's a Eurosceptic styled party. There has been a real push to centralize power in Hungary, and you know, whenever you think about centralizing power, it can be a move that is somewhat anti-democratic because you have fewer lower levels of government that are doing oversight and controlling things. Um, and also he has a nativist uh, tendency in the kinds of policies and the kind of rhetoric that he uses. I'm going to go through this sort of litany, if you will, of, you know, where is it that Hungary has, and, and particularly the Fidesz party, have undermined liberal ideals in Hungary? Um, and I'm going to start with the weakening of the courts and rule of law. First of all, the constitutional court in Hungary um, in the 1990s, following the transition period, was the principal check on the executive branch. But in 2010, the Fidesz party, with the leadership of Viktor Orban, decided that the constitutional court didn't need to have the wide scope of jurisdiction that it had. 
And so what was attempted to happen was to strip the constitutional court of its power, and particularly as it related to any rules on taxes and budgetary matters. The constitution itself of Hungary, which, which is called the fundamental law, um, was changed, it was amended, and it was amended so that it would allow for the government to bypass the court's judgment by making it constitutional, and catch this, to enact laws that the court deemed unconstitutional. So basically the government, the executive, could override what the courts were determining. The other thing that began to happen in Hungary was the changing in how judges are selected. Um, in the past, each party in parliament could nominate a delegate um, that would uh, then be part of the, the nomination pool of candidates to serve as judges. Um, now that has been changed, that only the party in power um, would be the party that would be able to, um, to nominate judges. Um, they also began to replace a lot of the judges with pro-Fidesz judges. Um, a lot of them had questionable political backgrounds. Um, they fire the head of the Supreme Court. They force people to retire that were not Fidesz uh, members, and they changed the retirement age to get them out. I'm seeing the, you gotta hurry up. So I'm gonna try to speed up and I apologize because I didn't get to Poland. Um, there's so much to tell you about how much is going on in Hungary of undermining democracy. Let's talk about corruption very quickly. Um, regarding corruption, the chief prosecutor is a former member of Fidesz and we have seen a 300% increase of rejections of complaints about corruption. So there's complaints about corruption and the government's looking the other way. Um, the state audit office, which um, oversees a lot of the government spending, is chaired by a member of Fidesz, and I could go on. We also have control of the media going on. We have a, a centralized media, and this is the piece, the media control is one of the ones that's the most internationally criticized of Fidesz's policies. Um, the media has been centrally controlled. And basically, if you have a non-pro-governmental position, you're not gonna be able to buy ads in, in certain uh, media outlets. And you will not be given a frequency, like a radio frequency, in order to um, be able to uh, talk about anything that is against the government. Um, Freedom House has qualified the Hungarian media as media only partly free due to these kinds of policies. Um, the electoral system has been changed. Um, there has been a great deal of gerrymandering and um, a changing of the election system that allowed the Fidesz party to gain more seats in 2014. And outside observers, um, the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights states that while observers found the election transparent and efficiently administered, opposition parties were found to have suffered a crippling disadvantage due to the unfair allocation of state advertising, biased media coverage, and a general lack of media pluralism. Very quickly, I wanna talk about authoritarian style. Under the COVID crisis, what happened was um, Viktor Orban said, I am shutting down parliament. He became dictator for a short amount of time, um, basically saying, I'm going to introduce whatever emergencies laws I have to, and it gave him extraordinary powers. Now this ended in June, um, but we're still seeing very similar types of policies still coming out since that moment in time. I know I'm out of time, but give me a minute. Let me get to Poland really quickly. So Poland is a very similar story. Again, we have a far right populist party, the Law and Justice Party. Um, they came to power in 2005. And um, what's very interesting is that the, the main power broker 
in the party, who is Jaroslav Kaczynski, um, is the party leader, but has not served in government. His twin brother did, but he has not. And it's very reminiscent in many ways of how under communism, the party and its chair was really the main apparatus. It's not so much who's in government positions. And so what's happened in Poland is we see a lack of transparency and oversight. Um, budgetary laws are voted on in side rooms, not allowing access of the opposition party. Um, the government ignores the Bureau of Research. The Bureau of Research um, for 20 years has provided uh, members of parliament reliable information and expertise. The whole institution has been purged and um, law and justice uh, members have been put into those places. Um, the judiciary, there's been a significant limiting of the rule of law, dismantling of an independent judiciary. And I want to talk about, so I can get to the guardrail, I'm going to have to move this a little bit quickly. One of the really interesting cases that just happened, and the, um, the decision actually was just made today. Um, so over the summer, um, there was a case that came before the European Union's Court of Justice. In 2018, the Polish government created something called the Disciplinary Chamber. And the Disciplinary Chamber was an institution that allowed the Polish government to dismiss judges and prosecutors. The European Court of Justice feared that this was an abuse um, to inflict punitive sanctions on those who show independence and were not bowing to the Law and Justice Party's will. The Court of the European Union ruled on this in July and said that the disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court in Poland did not guarantee impartiality. And so the Polish government then, their constitutional court, took up the European Court of Justice's decision. And today, it just came out today, I was very excited on my way to work to hear this. Today, the European Court of Justice has fined Poland 1 million euro, which is about $1.2 million, every day for ignoring the EU ruling that called for the country's Supreme Court disciplinary chamber to be suspended. So we'll see where this goes, if the European Union can collect on the money and if Poland will straighten up its act. Very quickly, I just want to mention about the violation of minority rights. Um, for those of you that are not aware of this, um, one of the other things that's happening in Poland is illiberal views on LGBTQ rights. Um, a lot of local governments have created what are called LGBT free zones. The European Union has been very vocal about this. Um, so we're seeing a lot of backsliding in um, you know, how Poland deals with minority rights. And we can bring this up in conversation um, as well. So just really quickly, guardrails, one of them is the European Union. I gave you one example of a guardrail. The other piece that the European Union is doing, I can talk about Article 7 during a discussion, but another piece that the European Union is trying to do is to tie liberalism using good democratic practices to their funding. There's a lot of money that goes to Hungary and to Poland. And so in the last budgetary um, decision of the European Union, countries are supposed to fulfill certain democratic ideals in order to receive funding. And if they don't, they don't get the money. So I'm going to leave it there, and I'm going to allow Professor Parati to, to take the stage. Okay, I am like the person who stands between you and lunch. I'm the person who stands between you and be able to, being able to have a discussion. So I'm just going to try to be as good as I can. Um, familiar graphic. The United States' constitutional republic was created with a number of institutional guardrails that were meant to disperse power. Madison lists these in Federalist, 20, uh, Federalist 51 and Federalist 10, if you remember. 
representation. If you don't like your representatives, you can throw the buggers out. Separation of powers. Not, no one branch is allowed to get all the governing powers. Checks and balances. The executive power can be checked by congressional vetoes and investigations and oversight and, and, and judicial review. Federalism, a little bit like we just heard in the EU. If the national government asserts too much power, the states will come and try to check it. And also something that Madison didn't talk about, but, but which they did, the, a Bill of Rights. The government may not abridge rights such as free speech and assembly and defendants' rights and privacy. These, are, these guardrails are what we expect to protect democracy against tyranny. Tyranny of the majority and tyranny of the minority. And Madison talked about both of those things in Federalist 51. Throughout our history, by and large, these guardrails have worked. At times, though, we've had close calls. In 1936, when fascism was brewing in Europe and global capitalism was in crisis, populist demagogues within the United States offered people easy solutions. Huey Long, first the governor and then the senator from Louisiana, railed against the structure of an economic system that permitted some men to accumulate vast wealth and power while others starved. Americans, many of whom had lost farms and businesses amid the Depression, flocked to him and started Share Our Wealth clubs across the country. Father Charles Coughlin, a once obscure parish priest from suburban Detroit, had 10 million Americans listening to his radio sermons, in which he railed against prohibitionists, predatory capitalism, socialism, and communists alike. For Coughlin, as for Huey Long, the devils were the bankers, the manufacturers, the big corporations. The cure, I alone can fix it through political and economic re revolution. It was a scary time, scary enough to prompt the novelist Sinclair Lewis to write a 1936 novel called It Can't Happen Here. In the novel, the pre you, you might want to read it, the president becomes a dictator to save the United States from lazy union workers, welfare cheats, sex crime, immigrants, and the liberal press. The protagonist is a local, local newspaper man who ultimately joins the resistance and fights back the onslaught of American fascism. How did our democratic system manage its real challenges in the 30s? Historian Alan Brinkley writes that Huey Long's radical ideas were co-opted by regular Democratic politicians, small d, in the executive branch and in Congress. Under President Roosevelt's New Deal, Congress and the President reformed the banking system and trade policy. They created Social Security for old people. They built the foundation for a stable, stable safety net. They sanctioned union organizing, adopted workplace safety and economic re regulations and pretty much took the wind out of the sails of populists who are making inroads in the U.S. Senate and at the state level. At times during the 30s and 40s, it appeared that the president himself was becoming an authoritarian populist. Roosevelt sought to enact a series of overarching economic reforms that would have set wages and prices across the economic system. When the Supreme Court struck down the National Recovery Act, the most ambitious of these, Roosevelt decided that he would seek to have Congress enlarge the size of the Supreme Court, you know a lot of these stories, so that he could pack it with justices who would not check his initiatives. But in this instance, too, the guardrails of democracy worked. Checks and balances would dictate that any increase in the size of the Supreme Court would have to be approved by Congress. Public opinion was resistance to this, and so President Roosevelt had to back down. I'm going to go zoom all the way past several decades of populist movements that we could talk about in Q&A, including Ross Perot and Pat Buchanan and Occupy Wall Street and the Tea Party, and bring us to the, the present. Today, globalization, climate change, migration, as we've seen in Europe, and rapidly spreading disease are placing pressure on the capacities of democracies across the world. The authors of our Federalist Papers never anticipated the enormous expansion of power of the presidency, they never anticipated partisan political polarization. 
They never envisioned communications technology that could spread misinformation so quickly. Could the United States revert from a liberal democracy to autocracy? It's doubtful, but in a 2018 article in our political science journal, trade publication called PS, Professor Robert Kaufman and Professor Stephen Haggard looked at Venezuela, Turkey, and Hungary. And they suggested that these systems like Germany and Italy in the 30s had gone through three stages and suggested that the United States was in danger of moving in the same direction. First, polarizing class or identity cleavages undermine the support for centrist political forces and open the door for autocratic electoral appeals. This is like the engine of what causes this to move forward. Second, the electoral victories of autocrats are converted into dominant legislative majorities that acquiesce to the concentration of executive power. That is, established political forces make devil's bargains. They allow the autocrat to concentrate power and ultimately squelch democratic processes. Legislators let abusive executives get away with assaults on democratic norms. And then in the final phase, executive powers are used to weaken the horizontal checks and balances on executive power, to weaken opposition parties, and importantly, to weaken political and civil liberties. It's all very slow. It's a cumulative process, as Dr. Green has pointed out. Quoting Levitsky um, and Ziblatt, Democracies may die at the hands not of generals, but of elected leaders, presidents or prime ministers, who subvert the very processes that brought them to power. In the words of democratic theorist Juan Linz, and again, um, re returning to a theme from Dr. Green, these autocrats reject democratic rules of the game. They deny the legitimacy of their opponents. They tolerate or encourage violence. They indicate a willingness to curtail the civil liberties of their opponents. Lock her up. Has that happened here? Kaufman and Haggard, writing two years into the Trump administration, saw some danger signs. American society has increasingly polarized around economic, racial, and ethnic grievances. Polarization has been tied to identity politics was stoked by political appeals and especially the, the demonization of racial and ethnic minorities and immigrants. This polarization had intensified public distrust in political institutions, including diminished support for democracy itself. President's party in Congress proved unwilling to investigate or censure the president's role in Russian interference in the 2016 election campaign or to keep the president from trying to exert undue influence over the Justice Department and other law enforcement agencies. President's rhetorical attacks on the press delegitimized the press in the minds of the public and created confusion about what's true and what's not, what's misinformation, what's disinformation. The administration restricted due process and non-discriminatory rights of foreign-born people in the United States. And we have an immigration class here, and during the Q&A, we might talk about what some of those measures were, because we're actually reading that right now in class. The and something I haven't put on the slide, but that Professor um, Dudek talked about, the Trump administration, already marred by allegations of corruption, was able, together with Congress, to begin reshaping the federal judiciary through appointments, which is perfectly legal and legitimate. The concern is that afterward, the president was going to the judiciary, uh, and his allies were going to the judiciary for judgments about whether or not he had um, won the election. And most, all of those judges pursued their tasks with integrity. But the concern is, when you have so many, a quarter of the federal judiciary, appointed by one president with one agenda, where, where does that leave us? Though President Trump lost the election of 2020, the assault on the guardrails of our democracy, that is the institutions of our democracy, has not abated. The greatest evidence that it's happening is the continuing physical, legal, and political attack on the certification of the 2020 presidential election and on the U.S. Congress and other national, state, and local political institutions. Um, former president lost 
fair and square under the democratic rules of the game, but when that happened, they attempted to get election professionals and judges to change the rules to create the outcome that they desired. And I think I'm going to repeat some of what quite independently Professor uh, Green ha um, developed earlier. Feeling that the former president's allies have engineered a spate of voter suppression laws across the United States that will make it harder for some people to vote, yes, but in some places will put political appointees instead of nonpartisan expert professionals in charge of certifying the outcome of elections. That is rejecting democratic rules of the game. Beyond encouraging violence at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th, former president's backers made more than 100 threats of death or violence against election workers and officials across our country, part of an unprecedented campaign of intimidation. As of September 8th, only four arrests had been made with no convictions. Legislators, and indeed the public, have failed to push back against these threats of violence. Instead, they seem to be or we seem to be enabling them. On January 6th, just as the mob completed its ransacking of the Capitol, nearly 150 senators and members of the House voted to advance the rioters' agenda. They voted to formally nullify the 2020 election tallies submitted by state elections professionals, both Democratic and Republican appointed from Arizona and uh, Pennsylvania. Many of the same members of Congress refused to create an independent commission to investigate the January 3rd, uh, 6th Capitol insurrection. The public is losing faith in the power of our institutions to govern, and um, I'm not going to prolong this by giving you statistics, but we could talk about that, about what some of those statistics are. Declines both in faith in U.S. institutions, but, but substantial proportions of the electorate who would say yes to the question, for instance, uh, do you think army rule is a good system of government? In a recent national survey, nearly one in three Americans said that taking violent actions is an appropriate remedy when elected leaders refuse to protect the country. And an even larger share of the public, 36%, agreed that the use of force is necessary to arrest the decline of America's traditional way of life. The constitutional guardrails have not been effective in preventing the ascension of a president with clear authoritarian tendencies. And these guardrails are proving ineffective at preventing threats of violence against his movement's political adversaries. In light of this, how can we protect democracy for th for, from authoritarian tendencies on the part of leaders and followers? And here you're going to see, hear a lot of what um, Professor Green um, prescribed. So there are tried and true ways. We can organize through pressure groups and political parties. Certainly Tocqueville, when he looked at democracy in America in the beginning of the 19th century, was amazed at all the groups that he found pushing to, uh, against government and advocating for their own interests. We can protest peacefully. We can use our knowledge of the law to wage lawsuits and challenge arbitrary concentrations of power. We can fight voter suppression through the best tool available to us, voting in federal, state, and especially local elections and becoming informed about local issues. We can support a robust and free press by reading properly edited and fact-checked newspapers or websites and varying our diet of these media. It's not necessary just to read a liberal paper that's fact-checked. You can also read a conservative paper that's fact-checked too, like the Wall Street Journal or listen to Fox News. We can learn how to do and consume scientific research, especially social science research, as a way of fighting against misinformation. And, and, and this is something Professor Green didn't talk about, but what we are doing right now, learning how to become social scientists, how to measure stuff, how to measure wh whether or not, for instance, there's a greater rate of crime when immigrants move into a neighborhood. That is ultimately a tool against authoritarianism. The last thing we can do is to fight against tribalism in our own community, this community, by listening to one another, listening to people we disagree with, working toward common civic goals like voter registration and community dialogue, which is exactly what we're trying to do today. <laughs>
So thank you very much. Can't wait to talk with you uh, in discussion. Thank you all, by the way, for those lectures. Those were really, really interesting. Um, we're going to take this time to take some questions from the audience. We have about 20 minutes, a little less. Um, I'm going to start us off. One question that I have that I think would be interesting to hear from each one of you um, is that we know that democratic backsliding has a lot of contributing factors. But if you could cite only one factor that you think is maybe a main cause or maybe a sure indicator that a democracy may not be so stable and may backslide. What would you cite? Is it maybe a lack of institutional guardrails, systemic issues, civil unrest, or even apathy in the electorate? Um, in other words, what would you cite as the main cause? Whoever wants to start. Do you, you want to go first? Or Dirk, you want to? Sure, I'll go first. I, I would go back to what I said earlier. I, I mean, I think you can build institutions all day long. Um, and I'm not sure at the end of the day they really make a difference if there isn't um, a really deep public commitment to certain values, including the value of democracy. So, and, I, and the inverse of that is also true, I think. If you have that deep commitment, I don't think the institutions actually matter. You know, you can have a parliamentary democracy, you can have a presidential democracy, you can have federalism, you can have a unitary system. At the end of the day, I think what really matters is, um, I think the, the public will essentially get what it demands and what it values. And so I, I think that there's a widespread sentiment in the country, and that can be put under tremendous pressure during times of stress, especially um, you know, national security threats or especially economic stress. But nevertheless, if you have this kind of robust sense in the society that there's only, there's one and there's only one legitimate valid system for governance and that's self-governance, um, you know, I, I think that's your best hedge and to, to put it in uh, the framework you used, if that's absent, to me, that's a pretty sure indicator that you're headed off a cliff. Um, I'm just going to add to that that all these things start with, with a catalyst. And a catalyst is usually economic or environmental. Um, so, and, and, and the, the catalyst creates problems that are difficult for, our, for us and our institutions to fix, and that's what causes the process of polarization and the potential for um, someone with authoritarian tendencies to step in. So we have to recognize that the forces that pull us apart are beyond our control, actually, at a certain level. But um, because they're going to happen. But I'll just second what Professor Green said, leadership and um, public commit, leadership at the elite level and public commitment at the bottom, at the grassroots level, I think are key in determining where that all goes. I'm, I'm not gonna say anything that unique. I think that, um, you know, particularly in the, the cases that I laid out, um, there's defi definitely socioeconomic tensions that have created a situation that government has been seemingly unable to deal with. And I think you add in, you know, COVID, the pandemic has certainly added even more to the challenges. I mean, if you look at the protests against mask wearing um, in Europe, in the United States, I'm gonna focus mostly on Europe, but you know, the kinds of things that are happening is the old boogeyman has come back. We've seen the rise of anti-Semitism. We've seen anti-Muslim hate. We've seen, um, things that we saw in the 1930s emerging in Europe. And I think the catalyst is that socioeconomic stress that has emerged. And then there are leaders and groups that take advantage of those and use the old tropes that have been used before. Um, and I think that is um, incredibly problematic. And so our job is to push back. I mean, our job as citizens is to say we're not going to stand for anti-Semitism, we're not going to stand for racism, um, and that we really have to hold, hold up our institutions. Don't let them fall. Thank you. 
Are there any questions from the audience? Anybody? Before I, before I keep asking questions, does anybody have a question to ask? Don't be shy. All right. Well, if you think of something, please raise your hand. We'd love to get a dialogue going. Um, my next question is, it, it kind of has to do with the antidotes to democratic backsliding. And I want to ask specifically in the United States. I, I know that some people seem to be concerned that like the United States Constitution is a very old document. And some people are concerned that there may, no, there may not be hope in amending this document. But how, how, would you, how would you respond to that sentiment? Is the United States Constitution still effective in preventing democratic backsliding? And if it's not, are, is there a men, an amendment you would propose such as the expansion of voting rights or something to add to the Constitution? Can I just say really quickly that to me that of course it's really hard to to amend the Constitution, and um, there are a few things that are really worth t t going through all that agony for. But voting rights is one of them, and um, the Constitution is really talks about voting rights in different places. It's really not clear about the right to vote, um, and if I thought there were one thing that needs to be added, it probably would be. A, an amendment that would guarantee the right to vote and establish some independent method uh, for um, devising uh, uh, or, or, for, or for setting parameters of what kinds of fair restraints there should be on the right to vote. I, by that I mean the process and the registration and all that stuff. David, do you want to yeah, you know, I mean, before we got ourselves into the present situation with the populism and um, all the stuff we've been talking about. I mean, I think the American democracy was pretty darn flawed, just, you know, getting out the gate. Um, not to say that it wasn't valuable. I mean, I think there's a lot about American democracy that is valuable and has been um, a sort of beacon for the rest of the planet over the last two and a half centuries. But I would particularly point to um, areas where democracy is really absent. So. Um, the filibuster, for example, which is now used extensively, was never intended to be used that way, but is now used extensively, and that and, you know that's minority rule, and that's essentially not an element of democracy. Um, the electoral college, of course, is a sort of ridiculous travesty, profoundly undemocratic. I would say actually the the, the area where second where we have the second biggest need of reform is um, uh, with respect to the power of our courts. That's the power that's known as judicial review, and it's essentially the power of courts to what some people refer to as legislate from the bench. So American courts, federal judiciary, is profoundly powerful, and you won't find anything really like that in any other democracy. And the question I think you have to ask is, if policy after policy after policy is being made in the courts, and the courts are a non-democratic institution, and they very much are a non-democratic institution, well, then do you live in a democracy anymore, right? If, if democracy is defined by democratic institutions making policy for that country, and that's not happening, do you live in a democracy anymore? Ultimately, I think the biggest thing um, that bedevils American democracy is that it doesn't serve the public. It's a, effectively a plutocratic system. And there, there's almost, I mean, it's almost laughable how we don't even talk about it anymore. We don't, we're not even sort of bothered by it, but the reality is that if you are um, a wealthy individual, you have vastly more access to American government and vastly more sway. And if you're not a wealthy individual, you have ba basically none of that. And that's not sort of some you know lefty Marxist critique. I mean, there's actually social science studies that show that when there's a discrepancy between what plutocrats want and what the public wants, the plutocrats win every time and the public loses every time. Um, so we have, you know, so that just drives all kinds of bad policy decisions in every imaginable area from taxes to um, healthcare to um, national security and on down the line. So that's another area where we sort of have these you know, I used the term before, Potemkin institutions of democracy. But if democracy is defined as the public being able to have its will translated into policy, and that's not happening, uh, 
you don't have democracy. And I think that was really a huge problem of American democracy, even before the, the present moment, which has just accelerated um, our, our problems. Thank you. Did it, okay. I, I, I just want to add something. I, yeah, of I, um, I would respectfully disagree about the courts mm -hmm. because the courts, um, when I think about the role of the courts, the courts have been a route for individuals and minorities to gain, gain protections at times when there was just no hope that legislative majorities were going to be of any help. And by that, I'm thinking about Brown versus Board of Ed. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, you know, if Roe versus Wade uh, has, has uh, asserted a right that you're interested in. So, so I, I will actually agree with you. I think if there are two areas where I would like to see powerful courts, it would be in the areas of civil rights, which is what you were just describing, and the areas of civil liberties, where the majority in both instances loves to um, uh, harass and suppress the minority. And so I think courts can be useful in that respect. But if you're talking about basic policy, when you think about where does basic policy in America come from on, say, abortion or gay marriage or a whole host of issues, it's coming out of the courts, right? They're legislating from the bench. And you may like their decisions or you may not like their decisions, but I think we should be wary of the idea that a non-democratic institution is making those decisions. I would submit to you that if that's happening, you don't, to that extent at least, if it's 50%, if it's 80% of policy, whatever it is, to that extent, you don't live in a democracy. I guess, you know, if I can just add something to, to you know, I mean, the, the one difference though, I mean, in the US, we'd like to think we have an independent judiciary, which holds the executive and the legislature to task. And I think that's important that it is an independent, not democratically elected um, institution because you don't have the public opinion sway um, and it's an independent institution. I think, you know, looking at the United States, um, the level of money in politics, I mean, the way that elections are run, the cost of them, you know, saying that if you're wealthy, you can get what you want, people are buying elections. Um, and, you know, in European countries, they put limits on how much you can spend on TV ads, how much TV time you have, which reduces the cost of an election cycle. Um, and I also think you have to have actor agency. If you don't have someone, when you had mentioned about civil rights, you know, if Johnson didn't say, I'm going to stand up for civil rights, President Johnson, it, it, things wouldn't have changed. And I think that you need to, and we as a public, need to choose leaders that are willing to do the right thing. And that means to protect minority rights. Um, and I don't think we're necessarily seeing that right now. And I think you know the examples of January 6th and members of our Congress that were hiding under their chairs still don't want an investigation of what happened. That's just wrong. All right, thank you. Are there any questions from the audience about this? Yes, would you like to stand up? For those who didn't hear the question, that was asking about the 2024 election and how effective will the results be on our democracy here? Well, I'll just reiterate what I said before. I think we are potentially you know, one election away from disaster. It doesn't necessarily mean that'll ever happen and it doesn't mean that'll happen in 2024, but you could imagine a scenario where say you have Trump versus um, um, Biden again and Biden wins, those are very iffy propositions, but just for the sake of argument, imagine that scenario. And then Trump says, no, it was a corrupt election and um, sets in motion a whole bunch of actions where it turns out differently than it did in 2020. And again, I would submit to you that in 2020, we just barely made it and we're still sort of barely making it. Um, that could have easily gone the other way. So um, I fear that we're very close to disaster. And if you look at what's happening right now, the Republican Party is basically purging itself you know, I mentioned there were some people, Brad Raffensperger is a guy um, who's the Secretary of State in Georgia, who basically refused to say that Trump won Georgia because he knew that Trump didn't win Georgia and he was getting enormous pressure. So basically, you cannot win in the Republican Party now if, you, um, if, you, if you're not committed to sort of the big lie that Donald Trump 
won in 2020 and then to make sure that he would win in 2024. If you replace those very few number of people who are willing to take a pretty big hit in order to uh, preserve American democracy with a handful of people who are not, it could easily um, go off the cliff, I think. Uh, I think about this a lot because we have to think about the possibility that um, that Donald Trump's going to come back and run for re-election. And um, I guess the, the answer that I come up with is, and again, um, the concern is not that he's conservative. Um, I teach a class on political parties, and I am absolutely committed to the need for a healthy um, and, and vigorous opposition party. Um, it, it's, it's the issue of being anti-democratic. That's what this um, assembly is about. My concern, so I would say, you know, we should be very, very concerned um, unless within that party um, there is robust competition. I have no reason to believe that there would be because I imagine that some of the younger and ambitious and talented people in the Republican Party are being um, threatened, really, and being intimidated against running against the president by some of the action, the other actions that are happening. And, and there won't be a vigorous um, a, a primary, for instance, in 2024. So I mean, in my mind, it's a big if, if something happens within that party. For instance, too, if that party c continues on the road that it began embarking on after 2012, and continues to recruit Latino voters, and continues to recruit black voters, that could really change the, the need to appeal to the, that part of the coalition could really change the message and the orientation of the party. But I'm not sure I see, in, I see that happening. And so I, not seeing that, I, I too am concerned. You know, we're, gosh, we're so, it seems like so far away, 2024, but it's going to be, you know, upon us soon. You know, I think from my perspective, I mean, as we're talking about this, I mean, the specter is Donald Trump. Um, and if he runs in 2024. And what I think is horrifying is that it sounds like we're, in, we're talking about Latin American politics. It's like a banana republic, that the, the party is focusing around one human being. If he passes, the whole discussion in here changes. I mean, it just seems very strange that we're focusing. And, and that's a, a very undemocratic concept that the idea of a political party surrounds one figure, one person. Um, and to be talking about that in the United States alone is, is frightening. Um, you know, where will we be in 2024? It's a long way off on some level, and yet it'll be a short amount of time. And it really depends on what role does Trump continue to play? What happens with the Republican Party? Is it still the Republican Party or is it the Trump Party? Which party is it? Um, and then, you know, what is going on? Like, what happens with the pandemic? What happens with the economy? All of these things are going to shape what 2024 is going to look like. And we don't, there's a lot of unknowns. All right. Unfortunately, we are out of time. But if you are still interested in learning about ask. these, if, yeah, <laughs> yeah, if you're still interested in learning about these issues, these professors are widely available, and you can take a slew of political science courses about these issues. And you can always visit the Hofstra University Center for Civic Engagement website at hofstra.edu/cce to learn more about upcoming events, kind of like this. So, thank you all for coming. Thank you, thank and you. thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Yeah.